Hello, my name is Frank Sackenheim. This is the Astro Photocast. This is my first English episode. I did a couple of videos already within uh, 2019 uh, in German, and I hope you like the English ver version as well. I hope that my accent is pleasing to you. In this episode, I'd like to talk about the differences or the advantages and disadvantages of CCD and CMOS cameras. And I did an interview with Steve Chambers from Attic Cameras in the UK. And I show you the interview as well as some thoughts of mine. After the intro, which is rolling now. As I already mentioned in the intro of this video, I'd like to talk about CCD and CMOS technology. Therefore, I've asked Steve Chambers from Attic Cameras if he would like to do a Skype interview with me. We did this on Monday and uh, yeah, well, I would like to show you the whole interview, which takes about 30 minutes more or less. And after the interview, I will give you some of my personal thoughts about the CCD versus CMOS debate. Also, if you're considering to buy a new camera after the interview and after my personal thoughts at the end of the video, I will give you some advice which camera to buy for your telescope. And here is also a little interesting thing. If you're living in uh, Europe uh, and you're probably um, buying your product by a telescope service, in, which is in Munich, then I can offer you a 5% discount. Every information about this you will find at the end of the video. So if you look into a camera, I think you can tell by just looking on the chip if it is a CCD or a CMOS sensor. So could you explain what are the main differences between those two technologies? Yeah, sure. Uh, if we start off, maybe the obvious differences from a, from a user point of view. Okay. It's going to be uh, the cost, for one thing. Okay. So the uh, CMOS sensors tend to be less expensive. Okay. Uh, and I guess the other thing they tend to have over, well, quite a big couple of things. So they tend to have smaller pixels than most of the CCD cameras that we would tend to use. And the maybe the technical difference is that they are much quicker to download their images. And that's kind of where where the whole drive from CMOS really came from was for higher frame rates and quicker ways of getting the image out of a sensor. Okay. I see. Where CCD has this real bottleneck where every pixel kind of gets read out one by one. Okay. Uh, the reason for that is, if I understood it uh, correctly, is that uh, CMOS sensors have a small amplifier on each pixel, right? Yeah, it's quite a complicated uh, system. Oh. The whole the whole CMOS uh, infrastructure, but yeah, the the CCD, yeah, there has one or maybe most four amplifiers per sensor, and using that, yeah, every single pixel effectively gets read out one by one, uh, and then with the CMOS, you have a whole array of A to D converters actually on the chip itself. And as you say, separate amplifiers on every pixel. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's, it's a much more intensive in terms of uh, the the amount of circuitry on the top of a CMOS camera. So and the CCD is relatively much older technology and rather dumber. But then when it comes around to it, it depends a little bit on do we need some of the advantages where CMOS. CMOS is really excelling. Okay, I see. So, um, from your point of view, uh, how come that the CMOS technology became so massive, uh, popular within, let's say, the last three years? If I look, for instance, at uh, a huge forum like Cloudy Nights or so, uh, I find a lot of topics about that technology, and uh, they are going back to, let's say, 2016. So. It's really like the last three or four years that this technology got really popular in, in mm. amateur astrophotography. But in some ways, you could even trace it back. Well, you could trace it back quite a lot further than that. So I think before three years, 
we the digital SLR cameras tended to be mainly CMOS. So the transfer over from CCD cameras, CCD digital SLR cameras to CMOS, I think happened, I don't know, maybe six years ago, something like that. Okay. So I think astrophotographers have been using CMOS for a while. It's kind of as that transfer went into, yeah, obviously, the likes of Canon and Nikon are going to get the new technology rather before <laughs> some of uh, some of the manufacturers that serve the astrophotography market. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and then if we went back even further, the the technology that went into webcams, if we cast our mind all the way back to when we had CCD webcams, uh, that was something that kind of introduced me to a lot of astrophotography. So if we go back 10 years or so, we had the famous Philips webcams. Yes. They had CCDs in them, and we could use those for astrophotography. Uh, but then they basically went largely obsolete about 10 years ago as CMOS got introduced within the webcam. And it's it's that it's those features that CMOS has uh, that's cost effective high frame rates that are really appealing to most consumer devices. Uh, and so, yeah, webcams was an early example of where people wanted higher frame rates and lower cost devices. And then obviously CMOS is the right technology to put into a webcam. Yeah. Uh, and and it's it does there has been improvements within CMOS where it could then get into other consumer devices such as the digital SLRs, which did require quite a high quality image sensor. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I think kind of it's I would yeah I would consider it to be going on for a bit more than three years. And yeah, it's a development of CMOS uh, improvements. If we start to get a little bit more technical, uh, some of the improvements have been this making finer and finer circuits with on a chip. So as the okay. as the processors drop down in size, then basically the amount of light that gets blocked because we have these transistors all over the surface of these CMOS sensors, uh, we're blocking less light with uh, with newer uh, with newer CMOS devices. So then they become more sensitive to light. Ah, than, okay, I see. Than the older, the older CMOS chips okay. were. Because I was always wondering about that uh, fact. Because yeah, of course, we were using CMOS technology in our DSLR cameras for yeah more than a decade now. Yeah. And all of a sudden, um, everyone was speaking about CMOS technology in dedicated astro uh, cameras. And I thought, hmm, is that a marketing thing or is that really a, yeah. an advantage in technology? So that is one question I would really like to, to have answered. Yeah, and I think some of it comes by demand. So originally there was a lot of uh, demand for the CMOS chips and there would be no way in which we could have got chips that would have gone into some of the Canon cameras if we go back to you know, okay. five, six years ago. Uh, and and now they're actively yeah they, they would like to see uh, other manufacturers using those sensors, so yeah things things change and I think that rush of development of CMOS has kind of is is, is ongoing a little bit but the major developments seem to have kind of occurred and now you know increasingly the smaller niche markets you know has has the capacity to serve us as well. Okay. So one thing um, uh, which is often quoted is the low read noise of those CMOS cameras. And uh, I've browsed a little bit uh, on, on the Attic website and found some very interesting CCD cameras as well. And they also have a yeah, quite low read noise. Yeah. So uh, what I found out now, because I was using CCD cameras for over 10 years now, and within the couple of, uh, within the last three uh, months or so, I'm working now with the CMOS camera as well, a color CMOS camera. And I saw in the bias frames that those bias frames are pretty uneven. And so uh, this is due to the technology of the CMOS chips, right? I think it does, yes. So, uh, I mean, if we if we get back into that kind of technology side of things, where we talked about CCDs, where every single pixel goes out through the same amplifier, 
that means you've got a lot of consistency on the way that you're amplifying yeah. and then digitizing that pixel. Uh, with uh, with CMOS, then what you tend to do is to run a number of analog to digital converters a lot quicker yeah. uh, and then digitize so we got, you know, the linearities are very, very close nowadays, but they're not perfect. When you start to stack images, you may well start to see some systematic differences between some of those converters. Okay. Uh, yeah, also, the, because we're reading out very, very quickly, and CMOS chips do like to get read out, read out very, very quickly, you actually dis, you actually harm the image by reading out more slowly. Yes. So they have to be read out very, very quickly. So there's capacitors that need to be reset to the same level each time you come to uh, digitize a row. We tend to digitize rows at a, a single time. So you've got, you've got a really short period of time to charge up some capacitors. Uh, if they don't charge fully and equally every single time, you start to see differences between one row and another row. Okay. These will be inconsistent between one bias frame and another bias frame. So it's, uh, yeah, CMOS has got, some challenges when used for astral photography. It's not really its natural habitat. Okay. Uh, so some of the things we do tend to do, the stacking of uh, of uh, image frames and bias frames tends to draw out any, any signal that's lurking at the bottom of that image that isn't okay. completely consistent. Anything that's not really random Gaussian noise starts to become apparent. And okay. yes, yeah, CMOS, we don't really need the speed as well in, you know, less, particularly deep sky astrophotography. So we get some of the negatives on CMOS without all, without being able to utilize all the positives. So it's a bit of a, it's, it's a bit of a square peg in a round hole, okay. is our phrase. Of, it's, it's, a great, it's a technology okay. that's being hammered into a hole that's not perfect size, but they are very, they are very cost effective ways of, doing astro imaging yeah okay so that yeah it that your answer fits pretty much to my experience so what because what i see now i assume that uh, a lower read noise of let's say one or two electrons more or less you won't see in an image so especially if you're um, sky limited for instance but those uh, variations in the background i can see pretty much even after stacking all those images I did. Yeah, that's just it's it's a curious. I'm 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 not sure I completely go along. I mean, read noise is read noise, so you always want yeah. as low a read noise as possible. There's no reason to have a higher read noise. I see. Okay. Uh, but you have to. There's when we game we again technical again, but you tend to be imaging in one of what we call domains. One is either the image is read noise limited or it's yeah. shot noise limited. So shot noise is when you start to the sky backgrounds. Yes. And really now, if you if you can tell a difference between the pixel values in a dark frame and the pixel values in you know a, a dark, dark piece of sky in your image, then you're probably actually in the shot noise domain. And in that case, it doesn't really matter too much what the read noise is. Yes. There's sorts of differences there where I have enjoyed using CMOS cameras uh, for deep sky is narrowband imaging at long focal lengths. I and see. They, you really spread out the sky background. There's not a lot of it now let through some of the narrowband filters anyway. Uh, and that's one of those examples where it's, I think it's got an interesting application to make use of that read noise. One more caveat on that one is that the read noise from CMOS where they're really low you tend to have to have the amplifiers turned up pretty much all the way on them to get okay. a really low read noise, yeah. which means the dynamic range or the full well depths are very, very small. Uh, and then once you're in that situation, then yeah, it's useful for narrowband imaging where you don't really care about star colors. Okay. You know where they are. But if you were doing normal RGB color imaging, read noise is very difficult to make full advantage of the low read noise that CMOS can offer you because it comes at the expense of dynamic range. I see. In one of your videos, I'm not sure if I got it right, but uh, you're saying something that if you compare CCD and CMOS, that it might be easier to to uh, to work with CCD image than with CMOS mm -hmm. image because of 
yeah problems you you can can have with CMOS. Uh, yeah, images. I think you're right. I think you're right, and it's all, it comes down to aesthetics in the end. So after you stretch an image and you okay. think that's about as far as I want to stretch it, because it starts to look not very very appealing. Now, if what's starting to appear is Gaussian random noise in the background, to be honest, that's more aesthetically pleasing if you like than if you see some structure, some lines, or some yes. some of the things that CMOS are more likely to be giving you. Yeah. So it might be a case of you know, technically you may be able to stretch a CMOS image slightly further in terms of electrons per ADU, but the results tends to be less pleasant so you probably would stretch a CMOS image less harshly than you would be prepared to stretch a CCD image. I see. So would you say, I mean it's one of those sentences which is, um, yeah, I'm not sure if you would agree but uh, would you say that CCD is still better than CMOS? I mean that's it's a weird question but. Yeah, uh, it's, I would say it's, it's I'd come at the other way. So it's CMOS, the new technology. If you're doing planetary imaging, I think CMOS is the way to go, yeah. undoubtedly. Uh, and if you're on a budget where, yeah, they, they are very, very affordable. Uh, so again, CMOS has some great, great application there. But just generally, uh, yeah, CCD. If we're talking about traditional deep sky imaging, CCD absolutely the right to go and it's much easier to select a pixel size that matches a reasonable normal telescope. Uh, we have all those advantages of binning that we can use as well okay. to make advantage of our LRGB type imaging. So yeah, for amateur astronomy, after, I used to think after we get above maybe 1,500 euros spending on a camera, yeah. you probably is a good point to really consider properly CCD cameras. Okay. Um, I've heard from a friend who was at CIDIC that year yeah, and yeah. It's, uh, that you did a, a, a little speech on, on the task as well at CIDIC. Is that right? <laughs> I wish I could remember what I talked about. Uh... <laughs> okay. Because he quoted, he just, he, he, he sent me a message on Facebook and that was yeah. uh, quite interesting because uh, he wasn't a hurry, and he just said uh, something like, uh, "The guy from Attic, which yeah, yeah, you, he said something like, um, I, I might quote you wrong, but uh, correct me if I quote you wrong, no. but uh, <laughs> he said something like, um, a C a CCD is still the better technology, but uh, people are asking more and more for CMOS, and that's yeah. why Attic is also into the CMOS market now. Yeah, yeah. Got, got me thinking and uh, I thought, oh wow, that, that's an interesting quote. I've never heard something like that from uh, uh, one yeah. of competitors. I mean, I, that, that does sound like the sort of thing I would say after building up an argument within a five minute, ten minute talk or something. So coming yeah. straight out with it may be a bit harsh. Uh, with, okay. with what we attic ourselves, uh, we serve a number of industries and applications. And some of those are able to transfer over to CMOS even more quickly than the astronomers. So we'll certainly look to make some CMOS cameras available for astronomers as we can. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's. I, I think what I did say, and if, if I go back to not the talk I was given uh, last year or this year. Okay. But I had a talk I was given a couple of years ago. That when we're talking about the Sony CCDs, some of the push for this is the Sony CCDs are no longer developed, and by 2025, uh, that will be the last time at the moment we're planned to be able to buy those sensors and then obviously sell them to customers. Okay. Uh, and I was, I think, one time I was saying that these sensors, these Sony IHCX sensors, are amazing devices. They've been forefront of development for a number of years, really low read noise and really flexible, useful devices for us to be using. And so this is kind of like a golden age of being able to use the Sony ICX series of sensors. Okay. Uh, and that's, so if anything, uh, yeah, over the next few years, if, if you're into astrophotography and haven't tried using on these cameras with the Sony sensors, CCD sensors, yes, give it a go because 
in 10 years time uh they won't be on sale okay i see so this is uh, leads me to the next question so from uh, we both can can predict the future but, hey. uh, <laughs> of course we can. but uh, do you think uh, that ccd is dying or will 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 be dying in the future and CMOS takes over or might it be that some uh, technology like EMCCD or something like that uh, will come into the amateur market? I love EMCCD. I would love to do a camera based around an EMCCD that's affordable to get into amateur astronomy. I've been working at it for a while, would love to do it. There are some devices that are coming close and I should be having a look at another one of those uh, in the next a couple of weeks or so. Okay. At the moment, uh, two reasons they are phenomenal. The ones that are really useful tend to be phenomenally expensive. So we're talking about That's cameras at a few hundred thousand euros. Okay. Uh, but there is it's an interesting one. That's on that one that uh, Texas Instruments brought out a series of EMCCD that was originally intended for the security camera market. And if that had gone ahead, then we would have had. Uh, EMCCD into amateur astronomy before now, but uh, CMOS came along and surplused that technology for the security camera market. And because the quantities weren't there, then uh, Texas Instruments dropped out of the EMCCD market. I see. Uh, so yeah, there's. I think CMOS answers a question that nobody asked, apart from cost. So a lot of the advantages from CMOS we can't really make use of unless you want to go at, you know, who wants to do deep sky imaging, take a 20 minute exposure and then download it in a fraction of a millisecond. It's some of the advantages for CMOS are not really there for us. Uh, even if you really narrow the, or make the transistors really, really tiny on the surface of the chip, there's still more transistors blocking light on the surface of a CMOS chip than there will ever be on a, CCD chip. So you can't improve on CCD by making the transistors really, really tiny because CCD see, just, doesn't, okay. just doesn't have those transistors on the surface of the chip. Okay. Uh, so yeah, at the moment for this for this application where you're just staring at an object uh, in the sky possibly with a cool camera taking pictures of several minutes in duration, I don't yet see where CMOS can surpass CCD apart from in cost. Okay. But I keep coming back, cost is important to most of us. So what you're saying is that maybe the way how we do deep sky imaging could change. And uh, mm. with that, uh, with that could change the technology or? I, I have my doubts. I think okay. from if you were putting a telescope on top of a mountain and you were funded by NASA and you were doing deep sky astrophotography, so you're making longer exposures, you would just be using a CCD. You wouldn't be looking at CMOS. Okay. And CMOS are interesting. Um, some bespoke, yeah, I guess through, come here, if you had a bespoke manufactured CMOS chip where you were having 10 or 20 micron pixels over a large area, maybe that becomes interesting. But because that becomes such a niche product, I see. Then it becomes a really expensive CMOS chip. And you can get really nice CMOS chips that are phenomenally expensive. So it's really about leveraging what is out there already for consumer devices. And this this where it may also get to say that maybe we've seen the most interesting CMOS devices for astrophotography might have already appeared. Okay. So because there was this drive to put CMOS chips into things like digital SLRs. And at that time, they the first series had relatively large pixels, but now all the drive is for more and more megapixels for an area, and with smaller and smaller pixels. So again, the most recent uh, the most recent CMOS chips that are coming out again and are not as exciting to us as some of the older ones. So I've just heard that one of the CMOS chips that are, is currently used in astrophotography quite a lot has gone obsolete and the replacement really has got small pixel pitch, but maybe that's not gonna be as good. I see, okay. So you said it already, uh, I just repeated. Yeah. So the cost is obviously one thing, a big point in this whole discussion, right? 
for pretty much everybody I imagine who's listening to this, <laughs> this <laughs> cost may well be important. It's important, sir. Yeah. Okay. Unless yeah. you got because- Unless you're government funded, it probably is fairly important. Okay, maybe this is the reason you said it in one of your videos that this discussion is some sometimes a little bit heated, and maybe this is yeah. one of the reasons because we're speaking about uh, we can a little bit look into your portfolio of at cameras, and we're speaking the, uh, about a difference of yeah mm-hmm. a couple of thousand euros between a CMOS and a CCD camera. So yeah, I found the the horizon cameras very in, interesting on the. Uh, on yeah. the one side, and those uh, attic one six megapixel and nine me- uh, nine megapixel cameras very interesting. But there is, uh, yeah, uh, the the CCD cameras are. I think already... everybody everybody wants to feel that they can get something for nothing or something cheap, yeah, and okay. then there is you know, there is a lot of emotional investment in trying to prove that it's as good as something that costs a lot more. And I think that's where some of the heat has got into this argument where. Let's just chill out. We've got this two slightly different things. One is less expensive, and one possibly is slightly more applicable to the application, though more expensive. If we and, take, yeah, sorry. As yeah, sorry, yes. So yeah, within the attic range, yeah, for we we do start with things like the CMOS sensors from in the horizon. Uh, we have a range of the Sony ICX sensors, which are probably the slightly more cost-effective end of the CCD range. You're really quite useful, but only go up to a certain size. And then we'll support the on-semi sensors. And after we get up to around three thousand uh, euro kind of mark, yes. the conference was the exact price is, but the Attic sixteen two hundred. That is, as far as I know, the only sensor that's been designed. Uh, but that's available to amateur astronomy that was designed for amateur astronomers. Oh, interesting. So the yeah. uh, OnSemi is the company behind that. They actually approached a number of our, the manufacturers within the field and saying that what sort of chip should we be doing for amateur astronomers? That's so if you want an actual device that was designed for amateur astronomy, actually the only one I know of is the uh, 6KAF 16200. I own one. I have to say it's not an hey. epic one, but uh, <laughs> I do have a camera. Yeah, we have a winner. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So if we if we if we should uh, let's say three scenarios, we have a beginner or or yeah, beginner astrophotographer and an intermediate uh, yeah. one who is already uh, familiar with uh, taking pictures with a DSLR, for instance, and a pro. Uh, kind of tie. Which of your cameras would you uh, recommend to whom? I don't know if there's... I, I struggle with this distinction a little bit. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure there's any real professional amateur astronomers. There's very few amateur astronomers actually. Let's say a well-experienced... Yeah, yeah, and I, it's all about matching what it is you're doing and what sort of telescope yeah. you have. So so much you gain so much by increasing aperture so if you've got a richie cretian you've probably got quite a lot of focal length there as well you're going to need a reasonable pixel size or the ability to bend cameras so there i do quite like the the camera you have the 16 200 i use that quite a lot we have one on our telescope at the moment okay uh, it's a really old camera of ours is the 11 megapixel 35 mil uh 35 mil camera, the Attic 11,000. That's an interesting one because... The, the pixels, nine, 9 micron pixel size. Yeah, the, the yeah. pixels are enormous compared with most modern cameras. Okay, yeah. Uh, but it just means that when you see the pictures, they always, even if you're not quite in focus, <laughs> the whole thing, because the pixels, are, they just really help and they're very sensitive because uh, they're so large. Uh, and that's, a, that's another one. If you've got the field of view to make use of it, uh, yeah, the six, 16200 or the 11,000 at the high end. Mid range, so many people are really enjoying using the Attic 460. So I think if you look on all the forums, a good mid range camera to really make use of all the CCD advantages and it has a low read noise. Okay. Uh, the Attic 460 is a really nice camera. And if we talk about the low end, then I think you're looking at a whole range of people, maybe not knowing quite where they're specializing in. So things like the Horizon, which also does the live 
view imaging. So we're, we're talking here about advantages of CMOS is be able to download the image quickly. That's really quite useful when combined with our Aztec Infinity live view software. So as oh, well as okay. using it as a normal traditional camera, yeah. you can just plug it in and get it to stack and align images on the fly. And I think a lot of, a lot of people beginning astrophotography quite like seeing things appear on the screen without having to do all the processing the next day. Okay. So yeah, I think that's probably the way the way the different cameras line up. But I think also from my point of view, when we get to the intermediate kind of astrophotographers, there are so many people taking really wide field pictures at the moment. And I think a lot of that is driven by uh, the CMOS chips because we have CMOS chips relatively large with small pixels they combine best with short focal length refractors. And then we talk about these really big fields of view where you're looking at, you know, getting the whole California, never yes. in one go or more than that. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I think there's a lot of enjoyment really to add by going for some rarer objects, looking up, my personal favorite is going to the art catalog and looking at the peculiar galaxies, small, oh, plan small planetary nebula, and there, the, the objects are small enough that you can't really make the benefit from spreading them out over 50 megapixels. There's just not enough image there. Okay. But yeah, so by using intermediate, using some of these Sony ICXs, you can get something that not everybody's taking a picture of and do a really nice job of it. Okay, I see. Maybe one last question uh, uh, for, for the people who are looking at the video and maybe decide now to buy an attic camera. Okay. So what, what, what would you say, what are the advantages of your company uh, compared to the competitors? Yeah, we, we don't like to go on a pretty big, okay. a hard sell or anything. But we do like to think that we, we've been in the business for long enough okay. that we really have put the quality into the cameras. And they go not just to amateur astronomers, they go into laboratories worldwide where they have to work every day, day in, day out, never get turned off. So we do make a very reliable product. Uh, it also, also it's European, so we have uh, support within Europe. It's very good as well. Uh, so yeah, so if you're looking to buy one of our cameras, yeah, I would hope on the basis of it's uncompromising with regard to quality and quality of image. Okay. And we have good support. Okay, very good. I, for some reason, I can't hear you anymore. But okay. Ah, oh, yes. Ah, oh, there you are. Yes. Okay. Okay. We're back again. Okay. Well, uh, for me, that's it. So I uh, thank you very much for uh, taking the time for that interview. Hey, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, I've enjoyed watching one or two of the videos. Uh, yes. So I, okay. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Steve Chambers and here are some of my personal thoughts or a little summary of what I took from the interview with Steve. The first question uh, I've asked Steve was about uh, the main differences between both technologies and my question was intended to ask for the technical differences and interesting enough the first answer that Steve gave me was that the main difference is, is the price. And this is something very interesting. Uh, so if you talk about CCD and CMOS technology, obviously the price is a main thing in this whole discussion. And the price is also one point why discussions uh, about CCD and CMOS technology sometimes heat up a little bit. Well, one of the advantages of CMOS technology uh, are the small pixel sizes. Um, uh, Steve uh, quotes it very often that CMOS chips tend to be tend to have uh, very small pixels, and yeah, we can see a little uh, tendency in this development because uh, for uh, camera manufacturers uh, like Sony or Canon or Nikon or whatever, it's very interesting to have smaller and smaller pixels because uh, those high res resolutional uh, megapixel cameras sell very well. And so we will have an ongoing development uh, tendency to have smaller and smaller pixels. And this is not a real advantage for deep sky photography as we will see later.
Another advantage of CMOS technology is the ability to download images very fast, to have very high frame rates. And Steve uh, says it in the interview that uh, this is not really an advantage for deep sky uh, imaging where we um, uh, tend to, to point at one object for a very long time, let's say 5 minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes. And uh, yeah, a fast readout um, is not one of the things we want in traditional deep sky imaging. CCD uh, images look smoother if you stretch out an image really, really high to get um, most out of it. You will probably see that the background of a CCD image is much smoother than the background of a CMOS image. So. If you're really into that high-end deep sky astrophotography, CCD is still the best technology for you. Now we look at the homepage of Telescope Service in Munich and look at a few of the Attic products. And yeah, as I said earlier, you will get a 5% discount if you use one of the links uh, to one of the cameras in the shop uh, under the video. And if you use that, uh, discount code which I will show you now here. So let's dive in and see what Attic is offering us. Okay, this is the website of Telescope Service in Germany and Telescope Service is uh, selling all over Europe. So if you consider to buy one of those Attic CCD cameras, you can do it via Telescope Express and with the um, code that I gave you, you can get a 5% discount on the products that I show you and that are linked below the video. So this is your website, choose your appropriate language and choose Attic cameras from that menu here. When you scroll down, you will find first of all the Attic Horizon, which comes in two versions. The Monochrome and color version. Let's have a look at the monochrome version. This is the uh, by now only CMOS uh, camera which Attic is offering. And it's using the very popular Panasonic 16 megapixel 4 third chip um, sensor. You have a pretty high resolution and a pretty low read noise. And this might be a very good camera for some wide field setups. And uh, for sure, you will get some pretty, pretty results with this camera. But if you're looking for a little bit more image qual quality, then you might have a look on the dedicated CCD cameras. And Steve was talking about the 460, which is here. It also comes in the uh, color version and the monochrome version. This is a CCD sensor, the Sony ICX694 with uh, six megapixels and small pixels of 4.5 micron. You have low read noise of five electrons and you have the full advantage of a 16-bit analog to digital converter. There is also the Attic 1 series and the Attic 1 6 megapixels is using the same uh, sensor, the Sony ICX694, but it's using an internal filter wheel. If you want some more a larger ship size and some more resolution, you might consider to buy the Attic 1 9 megapixel, which is a quite flexible camera uh, for wide field setups or for um, longer focal length as well. It's using the Sony ICX 814 sensor with uh, 3.69 micron pixels, 9 megapixels, as I said earlier, full advantage of the 16-bit uh, ADC converter and a readout noise of 5 electrons. Okay, and let's have a look at the larger format 
cameras. There's that Attic 16200, which is using the uh, Onsemi KAF 16200. Uh, it's a 35 mil chip and you have six microns pixels, a resolution of 5400 by 3600 pixels, a high quantum efficiency, uh, full advantage of the uh, 16... Oh. Where is it? Yeah, it's a 16-bit um, analog to digital converter and a readout noise of approximately 9 electrons, which sounds a lot if you compare it to the other cameras, but it's still a pretty read, a uh, pretty low readout noise. So this is a real large ship already, and yeah, but there's an even larger ship, which is the good old Attic Eleven Thousand, which is using the Kodak uh, Eleven Thousand chip with nine micron pixels if you're working with real large telescopes this might be still the choice for you okay as i mentioned earlier if you consider to buy one of those cameras you can buy them via telescope express and if you fill out the formula to to buy the camera then just type in the um the uh, discount code ts minus FS5, TS minus FS5, and you get a 5% discount if you are using the links below my video. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a quite long video, but it's a quite interesting task. And yeah, hope to see you soon. And maybe from time to time, I will do some English versions of my astrophotocast. And so if you like that, uh, give me a comment or uh, hopefully you give me a like and uh, subscribe to my video channel. See you and bye bye.